Hello. Hi. Hi. So I heard that the last time that you were here on campus that you said that if you had had a Stanford MBA, you would rule the world. <laughs> I, I wish I could have gone in. Uh, yes, well, I think that to be in Stanford is such a such an incredible lucky thing, you know. You're in this, and then I was told, what did the dean just say? That who is it that just said that it was all that it was very important to also be rounded. Well rounded, and, right? Well, you don't have a Stanford MBA. No. And you basically rule the world. Do you think I should drop out? <laughs> well, it doesn't look like she's nervous, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, DVF, you started your career um, very early on in uh, working as an apprentice in a factory. Can you tell us a little bit about that experience and if you really wanted to be a fashion designer growing up? I really didn't. Uh, you know, I always, when I talk to young people, I all, all, also always say, you know, unless you have a real vocation, like you know you want to be an actress or you know you want to be a, a pianist or something or an engineer, you don't, you don't know what you're going to do. And then, you know, when you start life, there are all these doors and which door is going to be my door and which door are you going to push? And it's not always the most glamorous door that will give you the most glamorous life. My door was, I mean, when I went through, when I met this Italian man and he invited me to come and to, you know, do an internship, well, he had a little crush on me, but. <laughs> And when he invited me to go over and to watch what you know he was doing, I mean the le last thing I, I was going to think is that he, that man, and that factory would be the most important thing in my life. So I think it's very open to, it's very important to be very open, and to be uh, curious and to pay attention and to kind of you know, follow your heart and follow what the universe tells you. And then all I knew is that I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew the kind of woman I wanted to be. I wanted to be a woman who could have a man's life in a woman's body. I wanted to be able to pay my bills. I wanted to be able to do the same thing as a man did, but I didn't know how. And then I found a way. And I was very lucky because it happened to me for me uh, very quickly, as it does now, you know, in today's world. I mean, so many, so many millenniums make it so early. And I was, um, I was, I, I mean, at the time there weren't that many, but I was one of them and I was lucky. So to that point, what the audience may not know at that time was that you were also a princess and not sleeping beauty princess, but like a literal, Princess. Well, I married a prince. You married a prince. <laughs> that was a shortcut. <laughs> but you continued working. Yes, so and I married that? pregnant too, so that was. <laughs> I was going to leave that part. But... No, why? I mean, it's you know, it's it's one of those things. I, I was engaged. Okay, so it's not something. <laughs> But, but why was it so important <laughs> for you to continue working, though, when you really oh, no, 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 financially? No. I had just, I was just starting. Okay. And, uh, but I, I mean, I didn't want my financial independence to come from my father or my husband. I wanted to do it on my own, and I did. And part of, you know, I was, uh, I, they, I mean, it also made my marriage not survive. I mean, you have to say the things as they are. So at some point I had to choose, and, um, and I choose. But he gave me two beautiful children, and we stayed friends forever, and, uh, and life was on. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about your business. When you started your career, you created a very
very famous wrap dress. And here at the GSB, we talk a lot about product market fit, about creating products that satisfied a particular consumer need. And looking at the audience, it looks like there are several people with a wrap dress on now. If you have a DVF dress on, can you stand up? <laughs> I think you found product market fit. <laughs> this dress has been relevant for over 40 years. What do you think that you saw in the market that other people were missing? Oh my God, I, it, it didn't happen like that at all. I mean, <laughs> I mean, at all. I mean, I was, okay. I was, work, I was working with this man. This man had a print factory, a printing plant. It was in Como, Italy. Como, Italy is basically the end of the Silk Road, right? The Silk Road starts from China. You go through all the thing, you go through, and then you end up in Como. In Como, there were all the silk manufacturers. And therefore, they, around them, there was an industry, there was all the illustrators and painters and artists that would sell their drawings and their paintings to, um, to those people in order to make beautiful prints, scarves, and so on. This and is her print. This way. is a print. <laughs> and, uh, um, so this man, so that's what I learned first. He would go there and look and this, and so they buy an artwork, and then you put it in repeat, and then you talk to the colorist. And I Italy, at the end of, after the war, was very industrial Italy, Italy, was just beginning, and so there were these very, very small factories that were being born, and there were families, and these people were colorists, and their grandfather was colorist, and the great-grandfather. So it was very like that, you know, and this one made handbags. And so anyway, this man uh, had a printing factory. So I learned about that. Because he was a successful printing factory, he would make all fa uh, scarves for Gucci and Ferragamo and people like that. He then needed more room. Because he needed more room, he bought the factory next door for the walls. When he went in, he saw all these machines that weren't doing anything because the people who had the factory before were making stockings. Now, you're all too young. You don't know what a stocking <laughs> is. But stocking is what people wore before they were pantyhose, right? They were wearing stockings with little garter bell. And, uh, so stockings was over, so these people went out of business. And so this man looked at, the, at these machines. He said, what else could I do with these machines? Because they were tubular knitting machines. And so he called in all the yarn people, DuPont and people like that, and they, they tried these machines with a thicker yarn, and that's how they came up with the jersey fabric. Now, there are two ways, there are two types of fabrics. The fabrics that are woven and the fabrics that are knitted. Jersey fabric is a knitted fabric. It's what t-shirts are made of. At the time, t-shirts, nobody would wear t-shirts except men's as an underwear and maybe sailors. But nobody else wore t-shirts. No, nobody else wore t-shirts until there was a very famous movie star called Brigitte Bardot, and she lived in this little port called Saint-Tropez. And there was a little shop there when they started to dye the t-shirts in all colors. And there was Brigitte Bardot looking so beautiful and so hot with this colored t-shirt that had a little Saint-Tropez sign on it and blue jeans and barefoot. And that's when t-shirts started. So Mr. Ferretti, the Italian man, started to make t-shirts and then, because he had a printing factory, printed T-shirts. And I was there when all of this was happening. And then he bought another factory that used to make nightgowns because they had very thin needles so that he could work this fabric. OK, all that is, I didn't think any of this would ever be important in my life. That year, my mother gave me a, a ticket, an airline ticket to go to New York to visit my boyfriend my boyfriend, the prince. So, uh, so I, went, I went to New York to see my boyfriend, the prince, 
who was very good looking, very handsome. He had everything. And you could imagine all the girls in New York wanted to marry him. So they didn't really like when I showed up. <laughs> but, but I was invited everywhere. And there were all these young designers who wanted me to wear their clothes. And one was called Holston, and the other one was Stephen Burrow. And there were all these generation of Giorgio Sant'Angelo, this generation of young designers. And I, and we didn't have Euro, uh, clothes like that in Europe and so on. So I, I, when I went back, because after six weeks of visiting Egon, I went back to Italy, went back to the factory. At that time, I walked into the factory. And I just had a vision. I said, oh, there's something I can do here. I can make samples, and I will try to go and sell them in America. And that's what happened. I started to stay late at night and work with the sample maker and the, the pattern maker, grab any fabric that was left over in, in, on the floor, and make a few samples. Then Egon came back on his way. You know, he was stopping from one, one bank. The next year he was going to go to Lazar, so he had a summer off. So he, on the way to Asia, we, he stopped in Rome. We met in Rome. Uh, we got engaged. And then he went on. And I went back to the factory. And I'm going back to the factory. And with this Italian man, you know, who's driving the yellow Lamborghini, and we go from factory to factory, no and deal. this and that. <laughs> and one day, he drops me in Milan, and I'm feeling so dizzy because I think it's a Lamborghini. And I, fa I fainted in the street. And I remember Italian people say, è morta, è morta, she's dead. And I was like, <laughs> I was not dead. But what I, but what I was was pregnant. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's what happened. So then, all of a sudden, oh my God, I can't believe it! I'm pregnant with this most eligible man in Europe. You know, everybody's going to think I did it on purpose, and I can't. I can't. This is terrible. So I went to Geneva. I went to see my mother. I said, I can't. I mean, this is not. My mother said, you're crazy. Anyway, you're engaged. You have to let him know, blah, blah, blah. Make the story short. Um, <laughs> Egon, Egon, I said, don't feel obliged. He said, no, no, no. I organized wedding for 15th of July. So at first, I went, oh, how dare you? But OK, fine. So we get married. So I go back to the factory, and I said, listen, I am pregnant. I'm getting married, and I'm moving to New York. Will you please allow me to make some samples from the factory? And that's what I did. And that's how I made my first dresses. And I, they were basically t-shirt dresses and shirt dresses. And, and I had no idea and no experience, except I was 22 and I was cute. And so I knew what I wanted to wear. And, uh, and that's, that's what happened. But this happened in the 70s. And this was the heart of the women's liberation movement. Well, the then I came here, and, uh, and Egon had you know, introduced me to Diana Breland, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, for, so I, 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 yes. And then this dress, and then the, the two, I, so for two years, I had two children in 13 months. So I had one child, and then I was uh, pregnant again, and in between, back and forth to go to Italy. And I had miserable little orders, 15 pieces, 55 pieces. And the Italian man would say, what are you crazy? I don't have a sample room. I have a factory. I said, please, 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 trust me. Have faith in me. So I would come back with more samples, and like that for two years. And then, uh, things, and then I, I had a little wrap top, and the little wrap top was, Basically, what um, uh, dancers, ballerinas wear, you know, to keep warm. It's called in French, it's called cache coeur. It's like hides the heart. By the way, it's also called um, robe portefeuille, which is wallet. Which it ended up being filling my wallet. Uh, and uh, so at first, at first, it was a little, a little top with a matching skirt, and that did really, really well. And then I said, well, we have to, why don't we make it into a dress? 
and that was the dress. And then, um, I mean, I started, I was 22. By the time I was 26, so seven, uh, we were making 25,000 dresses a week. And that's 50,000 sleeves, and that's a lot. <laughs> and uh, and so I and then I was living this American dream. And I read that the dress. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that people say I made the dress. Yes, I made the dress, but really the dress made me, because. This dress, thanks to this dress, I became very more confident. I was going around to women, wrapping them, you know, and I was feeling confident, so I was sharing my confidence, and I was selling my confidence, and then it was a time of the, you know, liberation. I mean, if you were young in the 70s, it was a very nice time to be young because it was somewhere between the pill and AIDS. You figure out. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so it was a very nice time to be young. <laughs> OK. Well, um, <laughs> so I read that um, you named your first dress Angela after the prominent Oh, Angela Davis, right. yeah. Yes. You know why? Oh, funny, where you read that? Uh, uh, no, I there was, research. there was a, a dress that had stripes. And, uh, I mean, it wasn't a very good reason why I called it Angela Davis, because she had been arrested, and it's the stripes. Well, but, <laughs> but what were you hoping I, I think that was a really bold move to name your dress after. Yeah, but nobody Simulator. knew. I don't even know how okay. you know. <laughs> <laughs> but by the way, I loved Angela Davis. She was a, she was she was so beautiful. I mean, she was strong. She was yes. There were all these women that popped out at this time. You know, there was Angela Davis and Gloria Steinem, and it was a wonderful. I mean, actually. Okay, I was a princess, right? Because I had married a prince. But actually, at the time, this when Gloria Steinem invented the word Ms, M-S, right? So you weren't Miss or Mrs, you were Ms. And I actually traded my title of princess to be a Ms. <laughs> because I'm a feminist. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of in fashion to be a feminist again. It went away for a while. So there's a m movement that's happening right now with women, um, and a lot that has come up around the Me Too movement, the Time's Up movement. From your experience with the women's liberation movement in the 70s to what's happening now, what do you think are the parallels? Or what do you think are the differences? And how do you, do you think that we're fighting for an extension of something, the same okay. thing? How do you think about so it? So when I was young, uh, we were feminists because we wanted to have e equality and um, in many ways. And uh, so that was that. But at the time, even though we still, you know, when you, I mean, I grew up like if you were a woman, you had your period and you would get groped. That's just it. That would happen. Men, your bosses would treat you somehow like meat and you just had to defend yourself the best way you could. But it was part of the DNA of being a woman. So you did, you know, and I was lucky because I, because first of all, I only had three bosses and they were all before I was 22. And, and also because then I had my own business and so I didn't have a boss. And then I also was in the fashion industry where women were actually, you know, it was easier for a woman to have a job. But I'm thinking, you know, now if all these other women 
who had jobs with, with male bosses who constantly you know, would touch them and do that. And, 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 and the fact that they didn't want to lose their job because, uh, because they had children, because you don't want to lose your job. You like your job. You studied for your job. You have a good job. And then you have this pig as a boss. And how do you deal with it? And so um, I think what happened recently is great. I think that it's just, you know, it's one step ahead and that men cannot ta treat us as meat, as we can't treat them as something else, whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, but it's, it's a good thing. It's a very good thing. And, uh, and as, as women and as mothers, I think that it's our, our responsibility to raise our sons so that they respect women. But... Um, it's, it's, uh, it's so much ingrained in society, you know, that, uh, but eventually it's, uh, I don't know, I have, you know, my mother always raised me like it was an advantage to be a woman. So I thought it was an advantage, but maybe I was very privileged. Maybe, you know, I had good legs, who, who knows? But, uh, um, but it's, 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 the truth is that I have never met a woman who is not strong. All women are strong. But, but, a brother, a father, a religion, or very often themselves, ourselves, we don't want to show our strength because we want our men to feel strong and blah, 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 and powerful and all of that, which is fine. But then there's a tragedy, there's a fire, there's something, and the woman gets one child and the other child and the jewelry and bam, boom, up the door. And you see that at the end of the time of tragedy, the woman's strength comes out and she takes over. So I think it's important for women to know, to know inside of them that they are strong. Then it is their decision to show it or not to show it, to do it. But what is the most important thing is that they know it inside themselves. Well, I think it's a, an interesting concept to talk about the privilege that may be associated with some women in their careers um, as it relates to not having to deal with that level of harassment. Um, and I know you had three bosses before you were 22, right? I think there are a lot of women in a lot of different industries that don't have that privilege. That's right. So particularly in the fashion industry, when you have an industry that is so contingent on, the success is so contingent on young women, young models, for your role as the CDFA president, which is the Council of the Fashion Designers of America, how do you think about protecting these young women? Well, we do, we do, we have rules, we have all kinds of things that we set up, and, and it is incredibly important, because, I mean, I mean, I did try to be a model completely not successful, but, I mean, they, that, that is all about rejections. I mean, it's just the worst thing to try to want to be a model, because it, it, it's, it's the worst. And... Um, but uh, no, as, as the CFDA, we are making rules and we're doing this and more and more. And, uh, but it's also... And I think it's also interesting for, this in, for the fashion industry in particular because there are, women are the prime consumers, most, right. most of the consumers. Right. And you do have a number of very powerful women in that, within that industry but there still seems to be this power dynamic where women are still subjected to a lot of the same things that they are in the other industries. And why do you think that is? Because we're stronger. <laughs> uh, you know, listen, women have to stick together, but the first thing is, you know, they have to feel strong within themselves. And they just have to we have to deal with what we have to deal, but together we have to make sure that we support each other. 
and industries have to support. And I think that all the things that Me Too and Time Up has really, really been helpful. And, uh, and it is a different time, you know, and uh, we have to make sure that that doesn't go away. I know you spend a lot of your time, your resources, um, whether social or financial, on empowering women and women's empowerment and that you created the DVF Awards, awards not long ago. Can you tell us a little bit well, about that? Well, it's going to be, this next year is going to be the 10th anniversary, yeah. It's, uh, yes, uh, it's actually my son who said, you know, you, you do so much for women, you should really reward them and give them money and, and do a, a prize, and then one day it will be like a Nobel Prize. <laughs> and and uh, so we started together when I got involved in creating the women's uh, conference with Tina Brown. And then at that time, I, I started this, this prize. And it is to, and it, it was really thinking about my mother, who was, uh, my mother was a survivor of Auschwitz. She survived. and. And uh, so it, it's to, for women who have the strength to, to fight, the courage to survive, and the leadership to inspire. And uh, the women we have given awards to are just remarkable. Most of them are not that well known, but they've done an incredible work. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, been, it's been a wonderful Wonderful. And then you create a family over 10 years, and then you see what they got, and usually they got other prizes after, and then you get to know them. And you know, I think that what is most important is to, I believe in the chain of love. You know, if you pay attention to people and you know them, and then you help them, and then I really do believe in that. I mean, I, I, I really believe, you see, now, I was very successful, very young, blah, 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 I created a company. Obviously, when you create something, it went up, it went down, it went, you know, it had many generations. <clears throat> but now I have a, a woman CEO that I think is gonna really take the company to the new, new world, the new digital world. And so what I want to do for the rest of my life, now that I, I am 70 years old, is the fact that I want to use because when you are successful, two things happen. One, you can pay your bills, and two, you have a voice. And when you have a voice, it's important, it's your duty, but it's also a gift and a privilege to use your voice for people who have no voice. And, and that voice thing, and that being able to share the experience that I have, that I, the, because I'm, I may be 70, but I really should be 140 for, <laughs> for, for how, how much I have lived and the, the, the different people I've met and the different circumstances and all of that. To be able to share that and to share my experience and my knowledge and, and all of that. And, and so that's what I would like to do for the rest of my life. And, and I know you all study business and you're all super smart and everything else. And uh, so, but my, what I would like to be able to tell uh, people is that women mostly, and this is very much of a woman's audience, so the other day I spoke to, I it's walked in there, there were all male engineers, I said, well, it's not gonna go well, but it did go well. <laughs> anyway, and uh, uh, is my big umbrella now, my big umbrella is design your life, mm -hmm. right? And so I have, because I want to do podcasts and I want to do speaking engagement and all of that, I wanted this summer, I said, okay, I have to structure. What does it mean to design your life, right? What does it mean? And so because I was in Sicily, I drew a Greek temple and on top of the, the roof, I wrote design your life. And then I put the pillars. And these are the pillars that I came up with. The first pillar, the most important pillar we all have is our character. Because you could lose everything. You could lose your health, you could lose your wealth, you could lose your children, you could lose everything. But you never lose your character, even under torture. And what does character really mean? 
Character is really about the relationship you have with yourself. The, you know, and to have a relationship with yourself is, is hard because it means you have to be demanding, you have to be disciplined, you have to do all of these things, but you have yourself as a refuge, as a shelter, and no matter what happens, you always have yourself. And if you have that, any other relationship is a plus and not a must. And there is nothing less attractive than being needy, you know? So character is really the pillar number one. And it's for, in order to, to kind of, you practice it every day, it's like the plumbing, you know? It's like, or pruning trees, it's all the time. You need to work at it. You need to have time, a little bit of solitude, a little bit of silence, a little bit of things, so that you know that somehow you could rely on yourself. Pillar number one. That's why I say the, the first number one lesson in life is the most important relationship in life is the one you have with yourself. Pillar number two is your body and your, ma your mind, your brain. I mean, you know, we, our body, we have so much power on our body. We can, you know, we can exercise it, we can forget about it, we can modify, you know, the shape we can, and the mind. I mean, it's only recently that I realized, I mean, we have this incredible computer inside. You know, I can speak three languages at the same time and drive and drink and all of that at the same time. <laughs> And, 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 and my mind is, is making me do all that. I mean, how does that work, you know? <laughs> amazing. I mean, that, it's just amazing, yes. but we have to pay attention to it, you know, and, and, and not, not take stupid drugs that will modify our brain. Anyway. You mean like taking care of it physically? Yes. So one, two, three, heart. Heart. Heart is a muscle right, that uh, pumps the blood and creates oxygen. So heart is life, life is love, life is, love is compassion, is, is emotion, and it's about to be a human, a human being. I know everybody talks about, you know, artificial intelligence and all of these things, but I really do think that the only way we can save humanity is by being humans. And I think that there's going to be, I hear it. I hear a lot of people who all of a sudden think about being kind and, and, and doing things to be human. And I Does think- Does that mean empathy to you? Yes, and it means paying attention to the next person. And yeah, it's, it's being human. All of a sudden being human and having a heart. I think that's the next trend, hopefully. I mean, we have to compete against whatever else is happening. <laughs> so, one, two, three, four, pillar number four is purpose. And purpose is work, is therefore work is your independence, your identity, it's your expression, it's who you are in society. So, I know you worry a lot about that here, so I shouldn't talk about it. And one purpose, and then Not you more have. Depth than that. And then you have uh, what I do, which is aesthetics, what you wear, how you surround yourself, the power of color, all of that. And that's what I, I, had, I thought my five pillars were. And then two weeks ago, I was talking to my 17 year old grandson, and he said, You forgot nature. And I thought, Yeah, that's right. I forgot nature. So we had another <laughs> pillar. And because, <laughs> and because it was six and I like odd numbers, I had to add another seven. <laughs> and, and, and my pillar number seven was rituals. We do things every day that we don't even think about. Like uh, many years ago, I did three coffee table books. They were photo bo photography books. And one was called the bed, the bath, and the table. And the bed, you know, if you think about it, people, you know, we throw ourselves in the bed without thinking, and we go and sleep in a messy bed. 
But look at what the bed, I mean, how important. We conceived in a bed, we make love in a bed, we're sick in a bed, we die in a bed. I mean, you know, so this, uh, the ritual of the bed and the ritual of the table, what to, wear, what to eat and how to eat and, you know, the pleasure of that. I think there's a whole ritualist things that we do, or even the bathroom, the privacy of the bathroom and whatever. So all of this is the be under design of your life. And um, does that sound interesting to you? Yeah. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why? <laughs> I mean, I don't know. So I mean, I said to, I mean, I said it to somebody and said, well, that's very generic. <laughs> I say, yeah, it's generic, but what isn't generic? Well, I think what isn't generic is the experience um, that your mother had and the influence that she's had on you as a result of her surviving Auschwitz. You talked about that a lot in your book, uh, The Woman I Want It To Be, and I would love to know how that that influenced the woman that you wanted to be. Uh, all right, so in order to describe my mother, imagine yourself in 1944 in Belgium, occupied Belgium by German, uh, this 22-year-old girl uh, gets uh, arrested, deported, and sent to labor camps in Auschwitz. It was because it was so late. I mean, she stayed there for a while, and then they, there was the famous death march, and they went to another camp, and then another camp. And 13 months later, she ended up in this third camp. And by then, she was in pretty bad shape. And, uh, and one morning, they woke up, and the Germans had left, and then the Russian came and raped them and whatever. And then they left, and then the Americans came, and they, she, she was in a very bad state. She couldn't move. She was brought to a hospital. She weighed 49 pounds. And, uh, and the, so they made her fill a questionnaire. The only reason I know that is because I, I, the Holocaust Museum, who I helped, that I helped, did a huge research on both my parents and sent me all this information. And I, this questionnaire comes and uh, where you say name, first name, second name, uh, where, where, you know, where you came from, and, and then state of health. And even though she could not move, she wrote excellent health. And that explains everything. You know, no matter what she always told me, no matter what happens, you can never be a victim. You know? And uh, she survived. She gained the weight back. My, uh, she, her fiancé came back from Switzerland, they got married. The doctor says you have to wait three to five years before you have a child because you won't make it and the child won't be normal. And nine months later I was born and I was not normal. <laughs> <laughs> so my mother, my mother used to say to me, uh, God saved me so that I could save so that I can give you life. By giving you life, you gave me my life back. You are my torch of freedom. So I was raised with a lot of, you know, I was supposed to be the torch of freedom. At the age of one, I had to speak. I had to speak in public, you know, my birthday. I mean, I always had to memorize. My mother was a tiger mom. She was tough and she would not allow me to be afraid. If I was afraid of the dark, she would lock me in the dark closet. Today she would be arrested. <laughs> and, and, uh, but after 10 minutes, you realize that there's no reason to be afraid. And uh, so obviously I'm very much a result of, of my, mo my mother, you know. So never be a victim, doesn't matter what happened, blah, 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 this and that. And that formed me, you know, but when you have a very strong mother, it's, it's, you know, you have to wait until she's gone for you to accept it, you know? So we're gonna do a quick lightning round. We have a couple minutes left. I would love for you to finish this sentence, these sentences. I feel most confident when? 
I feel most confident when I don't know when I speak to a nice crowd. <laughs> <laughs> what angers me most is Oh, I don't get angry very quickly. Uh, what angers me more most is when I witness lies. The thing people would be surprised to learn about me is? The things that people would be surprised to learn about me is that, I don't know. Um, Probably. <laughs> you certainly <I> do. do. <laughs> my superpower is? Oh, my superpower is my magic wand, uh, which I use every day when I try to, my first e email of the day, I try to use, I try to do something that doesn't benefit me, and I will introduce one person to a comp another person. I don't have to leave a message, I don't have to speak, all I have to do is write it perfectly and explain every ev well, and I may have changed that person's life. The most important advice I can give for this audience is? The most important advice I can give is the one I said before is that the most important relationship you have is the one you have with yourself.